I'm Kevin Elmy. In this presentation, we're going to go through designing cover crop blends. One of the scariest things when we start getting into cover cropping is deciding to do it. Now, the most intimidating part is deciding what to include in your mix. So what species are you going to use, how many species you're going to use, when are you going to seed it, all those management things are going to be the, you know, where do you start? So hopefully in this presentation, it'll give some, some guidance on, on where to start. The first step that I usually, when, when I'm talking to people, one of the things I need to know is what is your goal? So setting goals is the number one step. What are you trying to accomplish by using these cover crops? Is it a feed issue? So are you looking at silage or hay? Are you talking about grazing it? And in that grazing, how are you managing it? Are you going to continuously graze it? Are you going to rotationally graze it? Stockpile? When? When and what kind of animals? If you're looking more at the soil improvement, what issues are you looking at? Are you looking at, you know, improving the water infiltration? Are you looking at erosion control, weed suppression, improved nutrient cycling, building organic matter? All of those are going to influence what species we want to use. The other thing that we really need to take a look at is our natural resource inventory. So what are we dealing with, in other words? So do we want to look at our soil textures? Are we dealing with sand? Are we dealing with clay? Are we dealing with, with a loamy soil? Are we dealing with any salinity issues within that, that area? Are we looking at topography? Are we looking at something that flats flat or part of it's flat and then we have some steep slopes? Is it rolling? Is it uh, some low ground? What exactly topography wise are we looking at? We want to look at see what vegetation, what's there? Are we dealing with some trees? Are we dealing with grassland? Are we sedges or is there nothing growing there? Are we looking at some natural or man-made features? So this may be a once again, maybe related to topography, it may be uh, a, a pocket of bush or man-made features like having train tracks going through that field. So how does that play out in the, in, in the role of, of setting goals? And then the, one of the most important things that I look at is what plants or weeds are growing there now? Because that's going to give a really good indication where we are soil health, where we are in the fungal and bacteria ratios, what exactly is, is happening in that soil. The next thing we really want to look at is some of the logistics. When are you going to be seeding this mix? How are you going to seed the mix? So we're going to be broadcasting or we're going to be uh, drilling it in. What is the, the seasonal weather forecast? And this is where you know, we've been using Drew Learner's uh, weather forecasting service for the last few years. And that's, you know, one of the, the neat ways of, of you know, <laughs> using the best resources we have to, to look forward. So, you know, is it going to be a six weeks of drought? If it's going to be six weeks of drought, okay, maybe we'll delay uh, seeding these cover crops or use more drought tolerant species. And the last one that we you know the last part of logistics is how is that blend going to be terminated is it going to grow up until that first frost is it going to f keep growing right up in the freeze up or is it going to overwinter these are the questions that we need to, to answer so when we have these blends there's going to be lots of planning questions and any time when you do this pre-planning practice and we have things set up when we are able to hit the season, that's going to be one less stress in our life that we have to worry about. Steve Groff talks about treating your cover crops like you treat your cash crops. This way, we're going to be planning for success. One of the little twists, like rest of cropping, is we have to be prepared, be prepared to reevaluate our plan in season. And this is where... Once again, are, do we have uh, uh, drought conditions? Do we have flooding? Do we see different weeds coming up? Do we have different feed requirements through, through that uh, growing season? And just tweak it a little bit. Once we have our goals set, now we can start looking at what species we want to include in these blends. So the species selection that we're going to be using, we're going to be basing the species on 
what our, what our goals are, what our climate or weather conditions are like, logistics, so how are we seeding it, when are we seeding it, and all that stuff, and our crop rotation. The overall goals of cover cropping in, in the big picture over the, the big picture stuff is we want to increase our plant diversity that are that's growing. We want to add a green plant growing throughout that whole growing season. We want to be able to reduce our tillage. We want to reduce our use of synthetics. And in in the feed side, we want to have the ability to incorporate livestock on that land. Basically, those are the, the main five soil principles that I follow. So increasing plant diversity and having an active root, the reason why we want that is, number one, we're going to have better soil armor on that, that soil surface. But what we're going to be doing also is increasing amount of root exudates that are going to be released into that soil. When we have these different plants, different plants will have different root exudates. When those different root exudates hit the soil, that will feed different soil microbes in those soils. It'll be that trigger to get these things activated in our soil to get them working for us. So having that living root, having that plant diversity, key on building soil health in our soils. Some of the things we want to avoid when we are devising these, these cover crop blends is we want to avoid future grain contamination. What is meant by that is if we have a cereal rotation or growing wheat, barley, oats, triticale, and we are using fall rye as one of our cover crops, there's a really good chance that fall rye is going to overwinter and end up getting into our our spring cereal crop. And now we're going to have a contamination of both your the fall rye in our cash crop. That's going to be some get downgrading issues. We also want to avoid insect bridges. And what is meant by that is in the case if if uh, a producer is growing wheat and canola and that's their crop oscillation. I don't consider that a, a rotation. It's just an oscillation. When we have that that wheat and canola and they want to grow radishes to break up that, that soil, that hard pan, if they grow radishes after their canola, flea beetles are there and they're going to eat the radishes. If you grow the radishes after the wheat, the flea beetles may be there at low levels, but what's going to happen is the flea beetles will then overwinter in the, in the residue from the radishes and then be there to eat your canola. So that's the, the insect bridge. Disease vectors, uh, by avoiding the disease vectors, so this is where having, uh, you know, growing once again, going back to maybe the brassicas, by growing lots of brassicas in a tight canola, whether it's an oscillation or rotation, what that's going to do is potentially build up uh, some disease pressure like uh, rhizoctinia, uh, uh, maybe sclerotinia if it gets to the flowering stage, all of those diseases. So we want to, once again, look at a rotation, make sure we're not overutilizing one, one of the functional plant groups. The other thing we want to avoid is some antagonism. And in this case, uh, allelopathy is the one that jumps to, to mind. And once again, picking on fall rye. With fall rye, when the plant is in the vegetative stage, the reason why it people grow rye is because it, it cleans up land. And the reason why that happens is when the, that rye plant is in the vegetative stage, in the root exudates is chemicals that will create allelopathy in that soil. And that allelopathy is a chemical that will not allow other plants to grow. So if that fall rye gets ahead of the rest of your cover crop, that rest of the cover crop is going to be set back significantly, if not uh, completely killed. So the allelopathy in the rye, number one, is, is in the root exudates. And when that rye plant then switches over to the reproductive stage of its life, that allelopathy then accumulates in the straw. When you harvest that rye crop and that straw is spread back on the soil, as that residue, that straw starts rotting, it then releases that accumulated allelopathy in that straw. And so then you get that second shot of, of allelopathy in the soil, which will then hinder growth of, of any crops trying to grow into that. So 
So those are the things to try to avoid, and you, we, we want to manage these within our, our cropping system. Christine Jones and and uh, Bonnie uh, Bass Bassler, uh, they come up with this micro quorum idea, and basically what the the take home is is when we have a monoculture, we have so much soil biology happening. When we add a second species in, we usually see more vigor in those plants, uh, assuming they're using different functional plants, functional plant groups. But what they've really seen, and this has been replicated by Dr. Zavala in Oyen, is when we start increasing the number of functional plant groups, so increasing this diversity and, and what Dr. Jones talks about is, you know, that six to nine is kind of that, that sweet spot. When we start getting to that much diversity, our microbes, now they're, they're talking within themselves, uh, between themselves, and things really start happening. And this comes from that diversity of plants, those root exudates, getting those fun different functional plant groups involved in our rotation. And this is where this multiplier effect in this micro populations and activity really starts kicking in. So we want to add this diversity back to our soils. When I'm talking about different functional plant groups, the thing I'm talking about is this nice little triangles that I've, I've put together. So I, in, in the big picture, we're dealing with our grasses, we're dealing with legumes, and we're dealing with broadleaf. Because of the fact of all the diversity in the broadleaf, because the definition of the broadleaf is it's not a grass and not a legume, so it falls over to the, to the broadleaf, I have another little triangle in there saying the brassicas, non-brassicas, and forbs. These are the main five functional plant groups that I usually talk about. Where we can gain more diversity within each one of these groups is... So for grasses, for instance, we have warm season and cool season species of our grasses, and we also have annual, biennial, and perennial species within each of the warm and the cool season species. That, that also plays into, into account with the, the legumes, the brassicas, non-brassicas, and forbs to a certain extent. With, with some of these species, once again, local adaptation of certain species Maybe they're not adapted to an area and will not perform well, but there is diversity out there. So if we're missing one or two of those, it's not the end of the world. So with our grasses, the grasses, this is what produces our biomass. They have a typically have a nice big fibrous root system. We have lots of choices of these functional plant groups, so we can basically check off each one of those of the warm season, cool season, annual, biennial, perennials. One of the things that the, the grasses will do, which is important in the, the plant ecology part of it, is it will accumulate phosphate. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, most of the grasses are, are quite mycorrhizal friendly, the warm season uh, especially, and oats. But there's, there's a few little hiccups with our grasses. One being that it has a high nitrogen requirement. The other one is we tend to have a fair amount of grasses in our rotation. We may not have the diversity, but we, we definitely have grasses in our, in our crop rotation. When we look at legumes, normally most legumes have a, a taproot. Uh, they are the, the nitrogen fixers in our system. They're highly mycorrhizal, minus the lupins, and they create a very high feed quality when used. The negative to the legumes is it has a high phosphate requirement. It has a weak secondary root system. That's the reason why it has to be highly mycorrhizal. And they tend to be early successional plants. And what I mean by that is most of them tend to be relatively short-lived. Then when you get into the, the Cicer Monk Fetch and things like that, and the, the native legumes, they're longer lived, but they still have a, a, a niche... Uh, place in, in the ecology. So when you th remember back in the grasses where the grasses will accumulate phosphate and legumes accumulate nitrogen, this is where within the plant ecology part, 
where with the mycorrhizae and the, the different root exudates, this is where we have this really nice system, nice system of the grasses will accumulate the phosphate, which the legumes need. The mycorrhizae will create a highway between those two to get that phosphate over to that legume plant. In, in the, the big picture again, the grasses need nitrogen. The legumes produce nitrogen. So with that phosphate, it's able to accumulate that phosphate within that legume plant which is required in the energy uh, transferred to fix that nitrogen, and that nitrogen is then able to be shared with that grass plant through the mycorrhizae. So a really nice system, and this is the reason why we want to have those grasses and legumes growing together. When we get to the broadleafs, uh, once again, very diverse group, but it, I broke it down to your brassicas, non-brassicas, and forbs lots of functionality within these groups and this is what we need to look at is you know what are these plants doing once again when we start looking at the species selection it's going to be driven by our goals our seeding date our seeding method what our weather and climate trends are and a rotation so we'll go through some a couple of examples just to go through and and uh do an example of this. So in scenario number one, we'll have a 100 acre field. In this case, we're going to deal with a heavy texture. So we're dealing with uh, a higher clay content. We're going to do, in this scenario, we'll ha have good moisture. We're going to seed a full season cover crop, which we're going to seed in late spring. And we're going to be drilling this in with an air seeder or drill. And our goal is going to be taking a cut of hay and then grazing in the fall. This field will have uh, slow water infiltration, so we want to increase our water infiltration. We need hay. We would like to do some fall grazing. We want to build organic matter. The way we're going to terminate this field is at freeze up. So I've developed a, a spreadsheet that we can develop blends so we can go through and and you know, take a look at uh, get an idea what this blend will look like without having to grow it. So in this case, we're going to use some Italian ryegrass. We're going to use some Japanese millet. We're going to use some some Brasim clover, some Persian clover, some sunflowers, some phacelia, and some turnip rape. On the left hand in the purple, that's the number of pounds per acre that is that we'll be working with. Oh, I forgot some oats on the bottom. Uh, so the on the left-hand side, that's the the pounds per acre. On the uh, the uh, under the one column, it's it gives you the seeds per square foot. And what I've done is I figured out what an average seed lot would be, and then we figured out for every pound of seed that is seeded, how many seeds per square foot will that tra translate into. It does not take into account germination or seedling mortality. So that's where a bit of a, a science and an art is, is then uh, transferred into this. When we start dealing with really small seeds, our mortality goes up. As the bigger seeds, our mortality goes down. And then, especially when we start dealing with small seeds and seeding them too deep, mortality really goes high. So uh, things like TEF, where you're dealing with 1.4 million seeds per pound, uh, very sensitive to, to having that seed going too deep. So there's the seeds per square foot. Um, and then as we go along, the, the, the dollars per pound, and that those dollars come from the, the, the 2020 Imperial Seed uh, price sheet, and it gives you your, your cost per acre. And then on the bottom, it gives you your your price per acre and then total cost for the 100 acres. Within this blend, uh, if we go back to the, these triangles, within our grass, you can see that the Italian ryegrass is a cool season biennial. Our Japanese millet is a warm season annual. Our oats are cool season annual. We go down to the legumes. The brassim is a cool season annual. Our Persian, cool season annual. In, when we get into our broadleaf, our non-brassicas, our sunflowers, our warm season annual, our brassica, our turnip rape is a cool season biennial, and then within our forbs, the uh, phacelia is, uh, 
is a cool season annual. So we have each one of those those groups being represented. And then within the group, we have decent uh, 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 different choices in there. So in scenario number two, now what we're going to do is use the same 100 acres, so heavy texture, good seeding, uh, uh, good moisture, using a air seeder drill to drill it in, using a full season cover crop, seeded late spring. We're going to get, our goal is to get a cut of hay and then graze. But what we're going to do in this case is we're going to do a fall grace plus a spring grace. So that we're still dealing with issues of slow water infiltration. We still need the hay. We need that fall grazing, but also we're going to add that spring grazing option. We're still going to be building organic matter, but we're going to terminate next spring. So in this case, we're still going to have the Italian ryegrass. But it, what we're going to do in this one, we're going to use something that will overwinter. So we're going to use some uh, a festiolium which is a short-lived perennial grass. Still going to use the Japanese millet because we need that for that year one production. We're going to use some Brasim clover. We're going to use the Persian clover again, but we need something to overwinter, so we're going to use some sweet clover. Still going to use the turnip ripe, but to get a broadleaf that's going to overwinter, now we're going to add the chicory. We're going to add some sunflowers. We're in, in the customer, customer supplied seed, we're going to add the oats again, but we're also going to add some winter triticale. So once again, there's the pounds per acre, uh, the seeds per square foot, and make sure that we're our, our uh, seed density is, is okay, and there's our cost. When we look at this, this, uh, this next slide, the triangles, you can see now we're going to add more diversity to this system. We've added the festiolium, which is a, a cool season a perennial. Uh, the winter triticale has been added, so another cool season biennial. Under the legumes, now with the sweet clover, we have that cool season biennial. Go over to the forbs, the chicory, it's a warm season biennial. So we've, we've added that extra, extra little kick of, of diversity to it. In scenario number three, We've taken a 100-acre field, and instead of having a heavy texture, we're now gone to a sandy texture. We're dealing with, with fair moisture. We're dealing still with a full-season cover crop, late seeding, uh, late spring seeding, still want that cut of hay and grazing. Same issues of, of slow water infiltration, which can happen under sand, seeing it happen. We still need that hay and fall graze, build organic matter, but we, we want to terminate next spring. Very much so like that, that second scenario. But in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to tweak our seed density. Because when we're dealing with dry soils, we're not going to be able to support the same number of seeds per square foot. So that's going to reduce our cost. It's going to reduce our risk. Maybe we're going to even tweak it that much further where instead of putting the, uh, the Italian ryegrass in, maybe we should put some teff grass in. We've got lots of options which brings me to this next slide. I have not seen what I would call a wrong blend when people come to me with their, their blend and say, what do you think of this blend? But I've seen these blends where they have very limited use so that this way they have to be seeded in a, in a certain uh, time frame where it has to be seeded you know, after, after August 1st or something like that because the maturities are just going to get the plant maturity is going to get away on you. Now, saying that, I have not seen a blend that I could not have altered. So that when we're going through and, and someone will give me a blend, I can go through and say, okay, so what happens if we change the diversity somewhat? So when we're looking at it, maybe it's a little too heavy on the brassicas. Maybe it's too heavy on the legumes. Maybe it's too heavy on the, on the, on the grasses. Maybe we should change that. How do we get a, a warm season grass into that? Plant density. Once again, when we start looking at it and, you know, the quick rule of thumb when you're dealing with a, a grass dominated stand, the rule of thumb I like to work on is we want to have, you know, about 30 to, to 36 seeds per square foot. So if it's too high or too low, how do we change that around? Or, you know, maybe it's a nice balanced blend where we have equal representation. Is that the right density? 
and then the timing when to seed some of these species so going back to those those examples where i have that japanese millet in it because it's warm season species if we seed it too early in the spring when the nights are cool it's not going to do well it's going to just going to die out or seeding that warm season grass too late in the season uh, it, it's not going to get a lot of biomass. It may give you that root exudate. It may give you some of these other things. But if the grazing is the, the, the key for in the fall and seeing Japanese millet August 1st, you're not going to get a lot of plant growth to get the biggest bang for the buck. And then the, the termination, uh, you know, picking species, uh, you know, to be able to seed them to get enough growth or enough maturity so that when, when they freeze they terminate instead of something like buckwheat where if you seeded them on june 1st they're going to go to seed on you so those are some of the things to to be looking at in a lot of these uh, people with a lot of experience in these cover crops diversity is more important than density of each species and i'll stress a, a disclaimer on that and that's to a point so we still need to be represented per square foot when we have a very diverse blend and we have uh, 30 different species in and we want to have equal representation and we start looking at something like sunflowers which is a, a big seed and it's it, they're light all of a sudden we may only get one of those every 10 square meters which is that enough i don't know that's going to go back to what your goals are so i believe in diversity but there can be a point where we get too far so we that's where figuring out the seeds per square foot is really quite important so your soil and climate will only support so many plants per square foot as a quick rule of thumb in your mixes your seeds per square foot should be a, the, the seeds per square foot should be 120 percent of a monoculture crop of that main main plant that you're, you're wanting to grow so in the black soil zone for most cereals we're aiming for about 30 seeds per square foot for an oat crop so in a mix what we'll be aiming for is about 100 or 120 percent of the 30 which is 36 seeds per square foot quick rule of thumb when we're dealing with relay cover crops and relay cover crop is when we're going to grow two or more crops together with the intent of harvesting one but allowing those those relay cover crops after the harvest of the main crop to continue growing until freeze up or overwintering so it's a, it's a relay so it's going to go from one and it's going to continue to the the second one when we're seeding something like oats that is really competitive and have that uh, italian ryegrass and subterranean clover growing underneath we may have to reduce our seeding rates on those oats by 10 or 15% to allow enough light penetration through the canopy to allow that relay cover crop to continue. Otherwise, there just may be too much competition and that will smother that relay cover crop underneath. When we look at these, these cover crops, this is what I wanna see. I wanna see when I'm going through and, and creating these blends, I want that whole canopy to be filled. I want to see diversity. I want to see diversity above ground. I want to see diversity below ground. And this is when we're thinking of the species to, to pick. That's exactly what I do is I'm thinking above ground. What is a, a low growing, a medium growing, a tall growing? I think of those root system, I'm, uh, the root systems. I want to think about fibrous versus tap roots. I want shallow rooting system versus a deep rooting system. I want early growing species and I want later growing species in these mixes. This is going to reduce the risk of production in that field. Above ground, I want to be thinking about how that plant responds to cold temperatures versus hot temperatures. So that added diversity is going to, number one, have everything growing throughout that growing season, but then after harvest or after that, that frost, how do these these species continue to grow i want to have some something with drought tolerance i want to have something with that will tolerate wet feet and i want to add that plant that stays vegetative throughout that entire growing season whether you want to to winter terminate or you want to overwinter that's going to be your call that's going to go back to your goals but we want to keep that that biennial or short-term perennial in there 
So we keep that plant in that vegetative stage to increase the amount of root exudates because when the plant is in the vegetative stage, it releases up to 80% of the carbon it captures through photosynthesis as root exudates into that soil to feed that soil biology. Important thing to do. If you go to Cotswold Seeds, uh, they're uh, an English uh, seed company. They have some really nice uh, uh, PDFs that you can download off of their site. You have to kind of translate them a little bit because uh, things like lucerin, that's what we call alfalfa. Ribgrass is uh, plantain and uh, the coxfoot is, is orchard grass. But besides that, you get to see you know what these rooting systems, what they kind of look like. So when we look at these cover crop blends, take a look at your rotation. And the question is, how do you add more diversity to it? We want to look at these functional plant groups, warm season, cool seasons, annuals, biennials, perennials. And we want to increase that, that diversity in plant root types that we're growing. So my key goals that I keep stressing, and if I'm doing blends for people, is I want to keep an active root growing in that soil. I want to keep a plant in that vegetative stage as long as possible, and I want to increase the plant diversity. And that goes back to those functional plant groups. So those are the keys that I suggest to kind of zone in on it. And once again, it doesn't have to be every year, but in our rotation, we should be able to have something that, uh, that kind of checks off those boxes. And when we are getting into this, uh, neighbors, friends, family, they may be uh, a little critical about it. But, you know, the whole thing of, of this is when we start doing things differently, don't worry about criticism from people that you would not seek advice from. It's so supportive. And this is where there's a lot of good groups out there that are popping up. If you're looking for support, uh, regenerative ag or whatever <laughs> phrase you want to tag it but there's a lot of people that will give good advice of this is what I did this is what I saw this is what I like this is what I didn't like so go out and ask peers of you know what's working for them if you have any questions here's some contact information and I hope you enjoyed the the presentation